Okay, cool. Okay. Okay, so now, yeah, I think uh, Harrison, you can, yeah, exit your slides and uh, we will start. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we will start our session uh, uh, this time. And uh, our session is about uh, software validation and verification. And uh, in this session, we will have four talks and uh, uh, the, uh, we, each talk will, will be have five minutes. And uh, um, after the four talks, we will have around uh, 40 minutes uh, to discuss uh, with each other. And uh, we also very welcome um, any question from the audience to, to give the, um, uh, to ask uh, uh, communicate with the authors. And I will also help uh, uh, read out some questions if the audience only uh, test the questions in the in the chat. So, okay, so let's start. I think the first talk will, uh, will from uh, Rongchen and uh, he will talk about data-driven loop bounded learning for termination analysis. So now I give the time to Rongchen. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hello, everyone. I'm Xu Rongchen from Tsinghua University. Today, I'm glad to show our recent work on program termination analysis. The termination is a crucial liveness property for a program. A lot of work has been devoted to uh, the analysis of program termination for a long time. However, termination analysis is still challenging. The data-driven method has been applied to many fields in recent years and has shown its unique advantages. In our work, we attempt to integrate data-driven approaches with the termination analysis. Look at the right program with a single loop. In the loop, the variable x keeps increasing when it is less than 10, otherwise it will be reset to zero. Obviously, the program is always terminating. But how can we strictly prove it? For our input x, we can find that the loop must iterate no more than m equals minus x plus 11 or 1 times before finishing. We call such the m a loop bound for the loop. This is the main framework of our approaches. Initially, the default loop bound m equals zero, and the data set h is empty. In the analysis, we will generate a verification task for the current loop bound m and uh, check whether it is valid. If the current loop bound is valid, we can report the program terminates. Otherwise, we can produce a counting example during the constraint solving and update the data set. Then we can learn a new bound and repeat the procedure. There are two critical problems here. One is how to learn a loop bound, and the other is how to check the loop bound. We will further discuss the, uh, them in the following slides. We use a random test to generate the data for bound learning. During the test, we collect two kinds of information. One is x, uh, the program states at the loop head. The other is IDC, which represents the remaining number of iterations before the execution terminates. Thus, the, bound, uh, the loop bound learning problem is to find a uh, Loop bound candidate M such that for all data in data set, MX is greater than or equals IDC. Our paper proposed three kinds of loop bounds, including simple loop bounds, conjunctive loop bounds, and lexicographic loop bounds. In this presentation, I will introduce the first two bounds briefly. Suppose the current data set for the right program is, a tri uh, is the triangle nodes. We can apply a simple bound learning here. Uh, the simple bound learning is an optimization problem. The optimization target has two terms. V cost makes the bound result closer to the data points. 
and M calls makes the form of the result more simple. However, one simple bond may not fit the whole data set tightly. Thus, we propose the conjunctive loop bond learning to learn more local features. Our conjunctive bond learning will use a clustering algorithm to convert the problem into several simple bond learning problems. After the bond learning, let's consider how to validate the bond. Given a program and its loop uh, and its loop bound candidate, we first transform the bound validation task into a safety property problem. For example, we made a uh, we, we inserted uh, the red card into the original program. Then we made a bounded model check and based a quick bound check, that is, uh, unrolling the loop k times and checking whether the bound is correct. The quick bound check will help us falsify an incorrect loop bound in a short time. Finally, we use a safety checker to generate an invariant and exhaustively prove the loop bound. Note that our invariant synthesizer is also, also data-driven, so we can show the data between bound and the invariant learning and make the termination analysis more efficient. Based on our uh, approaches, we implemented a prototype tool called DDL10. We compare our DDL10 with the art termination analysis tools. Our DDL10 sold 136 benchmarks, and the average solving time was 5 pounds 43 seconds. In the figure of cumulative time for solving benchmarks, our DDL10 extends further in the solving number and grows slowly in the cumulative time. That's all of my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you, Rongchen. Uh, I think we will uh, have more discussion later. So the next speaker okay. will be the Samantha. Samantha, Samantha. Uh, he, okay. she will. Uh, Gave the presentation about uh, about uh, evaluating commit message generation. Uh, so, Samantha, you can share your slides. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> okay, we can see it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Hello. Good day, everyone. I'm Samantha, a second year MSc data science student at Chennai Mathematical Institute, India. Today, we are going to talk about our paper, Evaluating Commit Message Generation to Blue or Not to Blue. I would like to thank you all for being present here and watching this presentation. I would also like to thank my co-authors, Dr. Venkatesh Vinayaka Rao, Dr. Monica Gupta, and Sampad Deju. Software developers are well acquainted with a patch or a software patch, which is nothing but a code change associated or accompanied by a reference message or commit message, which explains the code change. There exist several commit message generation models that take code changes as input and outputs commit message, such as commit gen, NMT, N engine, etc. Our paper primarily focuses on the evaluation of such automatic com commit message generation models and tries to improvise the metric used for such evaluations. Literature survey reveals that Blue 4, which is primarily a machine translation evaluation metric, is most popularly used for evaluation of such commit message generation models. But since the structure and semantics of commit messages is different from that of standard English sentences, Blue 4 doesn't seem to be the best one for the purpose. In fact, none of the existing metrics that we have used for machine translation or natural language generation seem to be a good match. 
Our paper thus introduces a novel metric log and next for the specific purpose of commit message generation model evaluation. In our paper, we followed a three-step approach in constructing our new metric in the form of three research questions. The first step was to identify some six potential factors after extensive literature survey, which could affect the commit message generation quality, such as length, word alignment, case folding, punctuation, etc. Then, finally, we chose five factors out of these six chosen factors as valid factors to be considered in our formulation based on correlation with human annotated data set. The second step was to form the new metric based on incorporating all the desired factors identified in step one, and thus log mnext was created. The log mnext is a revised version of the Meteor Next, popular Meteor Next metric, which was devised by Densky and Levy back in 2010. We'll look at the formulation of log m next shortly finally the final step was to use our new metric on the existing commit message generation models and see which model performed the best when evaluated using the log m next metric and we noted that nngen performed the nngen performed the best in this respect The structure of log M next incorporates exact stemmed and paraphrased word matchings. It also performs string lower casing and punctuation removal as pre-processing steps. And finally, assigns a zero penalty score in case of exactly similar pairs of reference and predicted sentences. The formulation looks quite similar to the Meteor next metric except that a few changes have been brought about internally and a few additional modifications have been done. Now, there have been works comparing automatic evaluation metrics for machine translation, but none of them have talked about the need for a new metric altogether. And in this respect, our work stands superior or different from the existing ones. Nevertheless, we now have a long way to go in terms of building a larger human annotated data set which contains more reference and predicted pairs, working on learning based metrics by bringing them into the comparison, revising the structure of the metric to accommodate better case folding and paraphrase matching, etc. And finally, building an exhaustive commit data set including more programming languages. I would like to conclude by emphasizing that researchers and developers should henceforth discard the use of Blue 4 and its variants for evaluating commit message generation and rather enforce the use of a more generic metric, our novel metric log M next for the same. I encourage you to read our paper for more details and thank you okay okay thank you samata i think uh, yeah thanks for the talk i think we will move to the third talk uh, from yan jie that's uh, about rft refinement types for valid deep learning models so yan jie you can uh, share your slides okay uh, hello everyone uh, i'm yan jie uh, I will presenting our work on RFT, uh, refinement types for valid deep learning models. This is joint work with uh, Zheng Xianli, Hao Xianlin from Microsoft Research, Hong Yu Zhang, uh, Ming Wu from uh, TreeGraph Blockchain Research, and Mao Yang from Microsoft Research. Uh, deep learning models provide many configuration options for users to tune. Uh, for example, the hyperparameters, uh, neural architectures. Uh, let's, uh, let's see an example. This is a CNN model. It contains several modules, and uh, each module contains several cells. Subgraph, each node represents a COM2D operator. Uh, 
user can tune the kernel size, uh, which we, uh, we use the red font uh, to mark it. User can also tune the subgraph architectures. Uh, each uh, graph represents a combination of configuration, and the user will train it and uh, get the learning performance. For example, the accuracy. Then, a uh, user can find the best uh, uh, model and uh, train a uh, long uh, epoch and to get the final model. Uh, but the deep learning also contains many uh, type errors, like the traditional program. Uh, for example, the, pro, uh, the DR models, constants, variable, and methods. Uh, recent empirical studies indicate that the type errors of not uncommon. Uh, we list uh, two uh, representative empirical study. The first one is uh, the data set is from set Stack Overflow and GitHub. The second one is from the uh, production uh, deep learning platform. We also uh, we see that uh, the incompatible shape, uh, tensor shape and the tensor mismatch uh, is very common. Uh, for example, the second one, uh, it is a class of DR specific drop failure root cause. So we think that this is a very uh, critical problem. Let's see an uh, illegal shape error example. Uh, we list uh, uh, PyTorch as a popular uh, deep learning framework. Uh, Red DR model is a CN model which can do the object detection, uh, image classification uh, problem. Uh, it can uh, this uh, model will trigger an illegal shape error. The reason is that uh, uh, the NN's uh, N AR, uh, average put 2D operator uh, user size the kernel size is very large. Uh, so that the height and the width of the output tensor will be negative. Uh, it will trigger a runtime error. So reducing uh, type errors of DR model is very important. Significant shared resources uh, is uh, uh, especially uh, on the platform, uh, uh, first party or third party on the cloud, and the boost development productivity for uh, end user, reduce failures for deep learning training jobs, benefit automatic tools to improve search efficiency. Uh, but it, uh, it's a, it is very challenging because uh, the hybrid programming uh, adopted by their frameworks has the internal computation. Uh, we user write the program in Python, but lose the tensor uh, shapes. Uh, we can't uh, directly pass uh, the Python code to get that. Uh, there is a large number of possible hyperparameter hyper combinations and new architectures. User use the AutoML tools to define the search space. Will be very huge when the search space uh, become large. So we also summarize the common type errors of deep learning models. Uh, it contains the two large dimensions, hyperparameter error and the tensor error. Uh, hyperparameter hyper error contains two categories. Uh, one is the illegal value, uh, other is the improper value. The tensor error contains four categories, right? uh, illegal shape, incompatible shape, and uh, incompatible element type. Uh, so we propose RFT, uh, try to solve that uh, uh, error pro uh, detection problem. Uh, so we propose the refinement types for valid uh, DR models. RFT will refine each operator with logical formulae that describes the computation requirements on both tensors and hyperbar. It can check in the uh, validity of a model. Uh, it's uh, reduced to a constrained satisfaction problem. Uh, RFT utilize the SMT solver to obtain the unsatisfiable hyperparameter values before job execution. Uh, let's see an example of the refinement types of metamo operator. Uh, other operators example is complex and we list on the paper. Uh, we ascribe metamo uh, the matrix multiplication of function type. Uh, it is also called the operator in the framework, specifying that it accepts two input tensor parameter denoted by S1 and S2 and produces one output tensor parameter denoted by Y. Uh, so P1, P2, and P uh, is the constraint that uh, uh, for each tensor S1, S2, and Y, uh, it will constrain uh, shape, order, and element type. Uh, RFT, uh, uh, RFT is a tool, so uh, it contains a workflow. RFT accepts a computation graph, model specification to specification as input. Uh, then it will traverse the computation graph following the operator 
execution dependency to generate a set of constraints that the DR model should satisfy. Uh, we also evaluate the RFT's effectiveness on individual DR operators and the real world DR models. Uh, we also evaluate the efficiency in constraint solving uh, comparison with the relative work passive. Uh, we use the precision recall and the speed up to measure uh, RFT's uh, effectiveness and uh, solving performance. Uh, so we list evaluation. Uh, the first one is that we tune the hyperparameters. For example, the kernel size threat and operators COM2D and MASP2D to measure the effectiveness on real-world DR models. RFT achieves 100% precision and recall in it, it, all the experiments, confirming its effectiveness. We notice that there is a discrepancy in the ground truth of VG16 experiments, whose root cause comes from the differences between the official training program uh, for PyTorch and the, the TensorFlow. Uh, we also uh, compare uh, RFT with uh, PASIA. PASIA is a static uh, shape checking tool to detect uh, compatible shapes for TensorFlow Python programs. Uh, uh, other so, tools. Yes, sorry uh, to inter interrupt. Uh, I think uh, the time, uh, please count your time. Uh, we, we will have the five minutes limit. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I have reached the oh, final oh, okay. page. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, thank you, Yanjie. Uh, we will discuss more later. I think uh, we will move to the last talk, the, the fourth talk from Harrison about GraphFast uh, library API fuzzing with lifetime aware data program. So, Harrison, you can share your slides. So, Yanjie, you, can you exit your screen sharing? Okay. Okay. All right, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Harrison, and this is GraphFuzz Library API Fuzzing with Lifetime Aware Data Flow Graphs. This is work that I did at For All Secure along with, and I'm really excited to be able to share it. Okay, so the problem we're trying to solve is how to test APIs automatically. Um, and in this work, we focus specifically on C++ libraries, like this example here. But a lot of the concepts uh, apply more generally to other APIs. Um, so one of the uh, well-established ways to do automated testing is called fuzzing. And the idea with fuzzing is you define a wrapper function, like this fuzzme function here, that takes some chunk of data and does something with it like maybe it calls a parse image function. And the idea is that the fuzzer will invoke this function millions of times with different data to explore the state space of your target. But in a lot of APIs, like in this mock canvas example here, there is no convenient entry point that accepts a big chunk of data. And instead, we're interested in uh, testing the interaction of many small functions. So how can we do that? So with GraphFuzz, the main idea is to represent API interactions as data flow graphs. And so in the graph, vertices represent API endpoints, in this case, functions. And edges represent objects that are produced by some endpoints and consumed by others. So for example, here, we have a method on a canvas object. So as input, we need a canvas object and a point object. And after we invoke this function, we're free to do other things with the canvas endpoint. So they would also be outputs. So in general, you can imagine converting your whole API surface to a set of endpoints with expected inputs and outputs. For example, here we have a canvas constructor that produces a canvas object. And similarly, we have a canvas destructor that consumes a canvas object. And with this representation, the problem of generating a new test case becomes how can we link a bunch of these endpoints together such that all of the edges are connected and match with each other. So an example of a complete data flow graph representing a single API interaction is shown here. On the right, we have our graph representation with vertices and edges. And on the left, we have equivalent C++ source representation. Notice how on the right, all of the edges are fully connected and all of the types match. Additionally, with this representation, we can be sure that we're doing proper object creation and deletion. For example, we can be sure that we're invoking our Canvas constructor before calling Canvas draw point. And similarly, after we invoke a canvas draw point, we can be sure that we're calling our canvas destructor. 
Additionally, this representation lets us perform high-level structure wear mutations on the API sequence itself. For example, here we've added three new function calls and we've properly linked it into the graph. On the left, you can see what the equivalent change at the source code level might look like. Uh, importantly, with GraphWiz, we can perform this mutation and then execute the resulting API graph without recompiling uh, with a process that we call dynamic execution. And this lets us very efficiently mutate and test new API interactions. So during our research, we applied GraphWiz to a bunch of open source libraries, and we found bugs in nearly all of them. So here are four examples of crashing test cases that we found with GraphWiz. Uh, Skia is a graphics library used in Chrome and Android. RDKit is a cheminformatics library written in C++. And SQLite 3 is a database library written in C. It's worth noting that all three of these projects are included in OSS fuzz, and, uh, and yet GraphWiz was able to fuzz new APIs and find new bugs. So using GraphWiz is fairly straightforward. The first step is basically to define a schema, which contains a list of all of the objects and methods that you want to test. And in the majority of cases, it's actually sufficient to just list all of the function signatures you want to test. And GraphWiz will automatically infer the inputs and outputs. Uh, in some cases, it's necessary to be more explicit. And so we also have a more verbose definition. Uh, you can refer to the pre-recorded presentation or our documentation for more details about that. Uh, once you have a schema, you use the gfuzz command line tool to automatically generate harness files, and then you can compile them with Clang using the fsanitize fuzzer flag. And this produces an executable that you can run to start fuzzing. As a bonus, because GraphFuzz uses libfuzzer under the hood, the generated executable is a native libfuzzer binary, so it automatically works with any fuzzing as a service infrastructure like OSS fuzz. And finally, GraphFuzz is completely open source under an MIT license. Uh, we've included a bunch of Docker files with all of the fuzzers we built during our research, and we've set up a website with some documentation and introductory tutorials to hopefully make it easy to learn. Um, contributions are definitely welcome, so if you have questions or ideas for improvements, uh, please open an issue or submit a PR. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you, Harrison, for the talk. Okay, now we have... Uh... Uh, finished uh, all the presentation, the full presentation in this session. So we will enter into the next uh, stage that uh, we will have free uh, discussions that uh, uh, I think we have uh, still have uh, around uh, 30 minutes. So yeah, I, I, I know that we have uh, a, uh, a, a number of uh, a few um, um, audience in our room. So just feel free to uh, post your uh, questions uh, to the authors, and I, I think uh, uh, the authors uh, can also ask each other if you also have some questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, maybe because some issue about my browser, I I cannot see some uh, questions from the audience that uh, uh, posting the the chat channel. So. Jonathan, if you saw someone, you, you can also help me that uh, read them out. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. There's no questions yet in the chat, but uh, when it comes along, I'll mention it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe you can help me uh, raise that question. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. So, so maybe we can quickly... Uh, 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 the fourth speaker, you can quickly uh, give one sentence summarization of your work so that to remind the, the audience, maybe we can start from uh, Rongchen, uh, just quick one sentence summarization, yeah. Okay, our work uh, uh, use a uh, data-driven method to uh, learning loop bound uh, and, uh, and uh, we uh, Loop bound for uh, for termination analysis, we uh, we uh, we propose the three kinds of loop uh, loop bound learning and uh, uh, improve the uh, the validation uh, for the loop bound. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, Samatan, can you also quickly summarize with one sentence about your? Okay, so our work basically deals with evaluation, uh, uh, rather automatic evaluation of commit message generation models. 
and revising or improvising the metric used for the purpose. We want through our study and research, we want to encourage the use of a new and novel metric proposed in our paper, which is log M next, instead of the popularly used blue four metric for the purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's okay. It. Okay, thank you. So Yinjie, can you quickly yeah summarize? Uh, type error, type errors for deep learning is un, uh, are uncommon. We propose variety refinement types for valid deep learning models. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. So Harrison, maybe you can also quickly, yeah, summarize. Please. Sure. So the idea with GraphLuz is to represent API interactions as data flow graphs so that we can fuzz things like C++ libraries. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So now we have, uh, uh, let's, uh, Speaker quickly summarize uh, their, their talk. So uh, if you have questions, just um, unmute yourself and uh, ask. Yeah. So maybe I can uh, first uh, start ask some questions. Uh, so Rongchen, that I, I listened to your talk and I note uh, you mentioned you have a benchmark to validate your tool. I know that, uh, but I know that you, um, uh, you, you cannot uh, handle all the cases. So is there any reason that uh, um, to explain that's why you cannot uh, handle all the termination analysis cases? Yes. Uh, first, uh, the termination analysis is still challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, most uh, uh, tools uh, cannot solve this uh, all benchmarks. Uh, it is uh, mainly because the uh, First, the, the the termination analysis is uh, uh, the uh, hunting problem. It is uh, undecidable. <laughs> yeah, our our methods is to find uh, uh, a proof. Uh, try uh, try our best to find a proof. So it is uh, uh, impossible to prove all the program uh, terminates. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I know that uh, synthesis is also, yeah, listening <laughs> to your answers. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether you, you will have some questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if my audio works. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah. Hello, yeah, I just wanted to say it is always refreshing to see uh, work that is trying to solve these hard problems because, you know, you go to school, you hear about the halting problem and you're told this is impossible. And here you are, there are tools that, you know, can, can achieve this on, you know, not in the generic sense, because we know there are hard bounds. Uh, but uh, one question I had on this, Rongchen, would be, what is the limit? Like, if you had to um, quickly, I guess, describe to us, what is the limit in terms of programs that we can analyze using this, in terms of size or maybe complexity? I don't know if you have any, uh, any numbers off the top of your head. Yeah. Uh, first is uh, uh, the 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 size of the program is very important. Yeah, if the program is uh, complex, uh, we cannot. Uh, it's it's not easy to find uh, termination arguments such as the loop bound or the uh, 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 ranking function. So it is uh, that's it's not possible for us to probe the termination. Uh, the other is uh, uh, also the uh, the program always uh, uh, dif uh, are different uh, are different uh, from each other. We uh, sometimes the uh, gen uh, we can't find a general methods to cover the all uh, all, prob all, all situations. Yeah. Um, and then in the, th that completely makes sense. In each program, like you can write a very short program, a one liner that is horrible, and maybe it's very hard to to reason about its, its termination. But in, in your benchmarks, for instance, were these uh, benchmarks mostly, were they, you know, a hundred line programs? Were they, you know, a thousand no, no, no. line programs uh, or a million uh, line programs? Uh, uh, it's uh, almost uh, in 100 uh, lines. Uh, most of them are, uh, 30 to four, um, 50 
lines. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I, I note that we also have other audience that Tefik. Maybe you can say hello to. Oh. I um. I thanks uh, for the nice work. I, I just wanted to ask. So for the cons backend constraint solvers, expressions of that I assume impacts what kind of loops you can analyze, and there are different theories. And you know, so are you looking for only arithmetic constraints, or can that can this kind of analysis be used for other theories? So I'm looping, for example, let's say I'm looping over a string, and I'm doing one character at a time. Uh, that kind of, uh, or is it? Uh, so, what kind of theories, uh, backend solvers, to use for this? Yeah, we solved the, the program with integral uh, variables, and uh, the only theory we use is the uh, uh, integral uh, theory. Okay. Okay. Thanks. But do you think? I mean, is there possible generalization to other theories? If you had a constraint solver that handled string theory would the method applicable to termination of uh, the you know yeah. other um, types of yeah, i think uh, i think the uh it's may possible to generate to the other uh, theories but the uh, hard problem is to how to describe the uh, termination arguments like uh, uh in our paper the loop bound of the uh, ranking function uh, use uh, use this uh, uh, <coughs> no uh, if if there is no no integral uh, variables like the arrays uh, how to describe this uh, the termination arguments of these uh, e terms yeah good thanks okay okay thanks question from Tefik and. Uh... Also, thanks, uh, Rong Chen, to answer this question. I think we have a, a much more deeper understanding of the work that how, what's the limitation and also the possible future direction to to make the work more practical. Yeah, so we can move to the, uh, uh, if, if if the audience do not have any more questions, we will move to the next speaker. Yeah. Okay. There's actually yeah, one question in the chat from Samantha, okay. for Samantha okay. uh, to Harrison, which was, or you can read or I can read it, but see. I'll, sure, I'll yeah, yeah. read it. Yeah. yeah. So that Harrison, you can directly read the question. Yeah. And also, yeah. She's, she's, yeah. Oh, come on. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll read it for him. So, is, was there any significant notable difference in your findings, Harrison, uh, for the four open source libraries that you analyzed? Yeah, so in general, the um, types of APIs that we were uh, testing in the different libraries were pretty different. So like if you think about like a graphics library versus a database library, the, uh, the functions themselves do very different things. I think one thing that was pretty surprising was um, how easy it was to find crashes. For example, you, you don't even need to call very many different functions. You could call maybe five or six functions in a row and, and get a crash. And I think that's really... Uh, shows how uh, people aren't testing in this way already. So there's a lot of uh, untested code and just in you know, low, low hanging fruit in this space. Um, I think another thing that was interesting was we found a lot of crashes across all of the things we tested that are due to uh, deleting some object and then some other piece of the code was trying to use that object that had been deleted. And um, I, I noticed that when people write unit tests, people generally don't you know, delete objects during the middle of the unit test. So you might not find these bugs uh, in more traditional more traditional ways. So those were the main main things. Okay, okay. Thanks, Thank that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so uh, maybe I have a follow question for uh, Harrison first, that uh, as, um, yeah, I know you have some uh, data flow, uh, data flow information to to leverage the data flow information to 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 do fuzzing. So, do you first need to use some static analysis to construct some data flow graph? Yeah. So, um, instead of doing so, some previous works have done static analysis on API to construct a data flow graph. 
uh, with Grefla is we start with a user-defined schema. So it's the user's responsibility to say, this function takes these two inputs and produces three outputs, for example. And then using this nice formal specification of the API, we can then generate instances of a data flow graph. Um, okay. Okay. And yeah. So, so what's the overhead? How, how is the overhead of uh, let's a user to specify this steamer to, to, to when, when the user want to adapt to a library, to take faster library? Yeah, that's a good question. The uh, creating the schema is definitely the, the most expensive part of writing the fuzzer. Um, and that's the part where you generally spend the most time. Um, for a lot of simple API, if the API is very straightforward, um, most of the things you're writing are very, very boilerplate. It's like the same code, like it's very simple to define this. And in GraphFuzz, we remove a lot of the boilerplate by letting you just type the function signature. Um, and then it infers a lot of things behind the scenes. Um, and we actually tested during our research, um, we have a tool in our repository that lets you automatically extract function information using Doxygen. So you can actually go from like C++ source code and then automatically generate a schema. And there are a lot of difficulties with uh, functions that are difficult to define. But in general, we find that 90% of the functions can be automatically inferred in this way. And then the, the developer just needs to go in and fix the things that are broken. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. OK, OK. Maybe another quick question that, uh, uh, yeah, because this work is about API fuzzing. So actually, there are quite a few works that also target in this similar scenario, like uh, uh, previous, like Randoop, uh, it's also actually to generate a different data to to fast these APIs. So I'm not sure that how is your work and different from this work. Actually, I think in recent uh, maybe this year's ICST, they also work to some metamorphic testing to fast the C++ library uh, because it can um, they also devise some. A metamorphic relation that they can combine some APIs together to 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 uh, to construct some uh, metamorphic relation. So, how, how have you ever evaluated the, the difference between your tools and these tools? Or yeah, and talk about. So yeah, so we didn't evaluate against those tools. Um, we have in our paper we did a pretty extensive uh, survey of some previous approaches to API testing, and. Um, we also did a, a comparison to manually created fuzzers for the Skia graphics library. Um, in general, I think one of the, the novel components of our work is that uh, because we're integrated with libfuzzer, we can do coverage guided fuzzing on the API structure. And what this means is that if you generate an API sequence that um, discovers new, uh, discovers the target doing something interesting or doing something new, um, the fuzzer will save that example and it can reuse it and mutate it to generate new examples. And um, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we will move to the next speaker and the uh, Samaritan that, uh, yeah, I, I listened to your talk. Uh, I'm curious that uh, you mentioned that all the prior metrics are not usable. Uh, or maybe not that useful that you measure uh, how how good that the automatically generate commit messages. So so do you have any insights that uh, in the future how to maybe um, incorporate some key information to form to to uh, uh, to set up a new metric? Do you have any insight on this? And uh, do you imagine that in the future? I think this is a very uh, useful useful future if. If indeed there, there is a tool, such a tool that can automatically generate commit message, that will be useful. So, uh, do you think in the future it's it's uh, it's feasible that uh, can generate like human uh, those messages written by the human? Yeah. Yes. So there exists such uh, not one but um, three or four such uh, models which actually take commit messages as input and produces, uh, sorry, which, uh, which takes code changes as input and outputs a commit message. We, um, our focus was to change the way these models are evaluated and use a new metric, which is more reasonable to evaluate commit messages since commit messages, um, we believe are 
semantically different from natural language uh, or standard English sentences. And that's why the metrics that were used for machine translation evaluation that um, select uh, for evaluating commit messages specifically. And that's why we proposed a new metric that is log m next which actually is uh, designed specifically for the sole uh, evaluation so it because it takes factors that we feel should be uh, considered for evaluation of commit message uh, the length of message the semantic punctuation the, so the differences between the reference and predicted sentence in a test in a test um, test um, training data whatever that should by uh, punctuations that should not that should be affected by length variations etc so keeping all these um, factors in placed instead of the uh, commonly used blue metric mm -hmm. in practice now mm -hmm. okay oh it, it looks we lost Samerton due to the network signal okay uh maybe we can move to the next also have some question for yin yin jie yeah we can return back when some uh, come back come back yeah. So, so Yan you uh, you present a work about the to finding some type errors for uh, to check to check the deep learning models. So, yeah, actually, I'm curious that uh, um, how how is the false positive or the true positive for for this net technique? Yeah, can you say say something about this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, currently, Rafty achieves uh one hundred percent uh for uh, for this issue uh, because we manually uh, uh, verify the error and uh, attach new constraints to this tool and then make it um, become more and more pressed for this issue. And we also mm -hmm. manually study the source code to obtain the constraints. And we also use further to trigger lots of to see the runtime errors. So we could uh, oh. build it more and more robust. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because you you have the uh, computation of uh, false positive and true positive. So I guess you have a benchmark, a ground truth data set of uh, different. Yes. Uh, okay, so this is also done in in your uh, this work. Uh, yes, uh, but uh, this uh, this uh, okay is also done from this work and the uh, future maybe we will make it more uh, diverse and uh, maybe have a new work. Okay, okay. So as for the type errors, are there any other types of errors uh, you find is also like common that, uh, or is it possible in the future to design such a um, static check uh, or for, for other types of error in your in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, currently um, we only observe the uh, uh, we list on the table the common type errors, uh, because deep learning models is uh, error uh, and uh, deep learning job errors is a, a more large topic. It contains many errors from person, uh, from the environment, uh, from our previous uh, list that. Uh, but uh, for deep learning type errors, we only observe the errors and the list in the table and Rafty can. Uh, so it currently we um, didn't uh, see more new uh, type errors uh, f uh, for deep learning specific, uh, but uh, uh, the errors from Python we didn't list on it. Okay, okay. So during research, yeah, like, um, uh, do you uh, have you ever find that maybe some there could be some uh, inherent errors from the uh, deep learning framework? Uh, that may also uh, affect the, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, deep, deep learning models uh, uh, for TensorFlow and the PyTorch, uh, they contain some uh, different implementation. So we trigger on a 
specific framework, but other not trigger, uh, we also list that. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, the TensorFlow will constrain the dilation and the stress it has the specific constraint. Uh, we think that uh, the framework also have space uh, to improve from uh, these errors. Uh, maybe um, testing the framework is amazing uh, error. Uh, could uh, pay effort to that. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So yeah, I I know Sam, uh, Sam is come comes back. So can you continue your prayer answers that you haven't finished that? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was saying. Um, our model just proposes a new metric log m next. Uh, how, was I not audible um, due to network issues? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There's some. There's some breaking. And you cut off. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, what I am saying is that um, our work proposes a new metric log m next, and it was prepared or formed keeping in mind the various factors that should affect or um, impact quality of commit message generation models. And based on that, the metric that we propose, um, we suggest our developers should focus on the use of a more generic metric like ours, uh, the popularly used blue metric that is currently in use, because we believe that there exists some difference between semantics of commit messages and English standard English language and hence the evaluation metrics made for evaluating English sentences does not apply to evaluating commit messages specifically so that's the main issue okay okay thank you thank you okay so so yeah uh so jonathan is there any other question on the on the chat that haven't been resolved none more in the in the text chat i have a question for harrison though more a uh, curiosity on the the graph um creation right so you mentioned the nodes were i think functions and the edges were pretty much um inputs and outputs uh, i guess we're not really doing object oriented so they weren't really classes but some data structure or maybe it was C plus plus or C. I forget. Uh, C plus plus and C. So they're like C plus plus and C. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so we have some data structures there. But for um, for for finding your valid graphs to test on, uh, what what kind of algorithm did you actually use for, you know, creating that graph? Sure. Yeah. That's a good question. So the approach we took um, in our implementation uh, was basically. Uh, we have a set of mutations that we can perform that modify one endpoint at a time. Um, and there's sort of a graphic in the paper, but for example, it could be just like swapping one endpoint for a different endpoint in a graph. And it works in two steps. So the first step is we perform some mutation that potentially leaves the graph in like an incomplete state. So maybe we have a method call on the canvas object, but we're missing a constructor for it. So there's like this edge missing. And then the second step is we have uh, something called the edge completion algorithm. And what that basically does is it, it goes through and it looks for all the edges that are missing and it generates some subgraph that we can connect at that point that will like complete the graph. So for example, if we have a graph with one edge missing that has type constructor or type canvas, sorry, we can, uh, we can fill it in by adding in our canvas constructor endpoint and then linking it together. Thanks. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I, I note we have one audience is also, yeah, Sanfu. I, I'm not sure whether I pronounced correctly. I, I note you are also in, in yeah, in, in this room. Maybe you can also, yeah, ask something if you have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Maybe he's. He or she is too shy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think we have still have around five minutes. Maybe we can quickly uh, let each speaker to uh, have some brief uh, comments 
that uh, uh, on how is um, how do you feel that the, the work or the the field you are working on and what's maybe the common challenges you think is needed to be addressed in the future yeah maybe just quickly uh, give some insights in this direction yeah so maybe we can uh, start from Longchen. okay uh for my work the i think there are uh two main uh two main directions to continue first is the, the how to uh in in our work we learned three different kinds of loop bound independently uh the uh the uh, the first direction is how to integrate these three direct uh these three bounds together uh and uh, the the second direction is to how to find the more uh, more data driven methods to apply the in uh, termination analysis to make the uh, analysis more efficient. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rongchen. Yeah. Yes, Samerton. Yes, you can. Yeah. So the biggest challenge that we faced was. Um, building a human annotated data set for comparison or identification of the um, six factors uh, that we eventually um, could identify so because of time constraints as well as um, due to lack of proficient um, human annotators we could not um, go for building our own human annotated data set rather we had to settle for uh, quite a small um, sized um, data set of near 100 so that was a secondary data set and but we had to settle with it due to time constraints etc so the bigger bigger um, um, work that uh, lies behind before us is now to build a larger our own human annotated data set and finding the perf finding the right persons who can actually um, um, annotate the commit messages is also a big challenge that I feel or we feel uh, will face if we go to do that. Apart from that, um, another future direction in which we want to work is revising the metric that we um, have proposed. So a major major portion of it has been adopted from the Meteor Next metric devised by Densky and Levy. So we should also um, improvise our metric in terms of better paraphrase and synonym matching. We should also care, be careful while removing uh, punctuations from the sentences and also case folding. So these are the possible um, ways in which we can improve our work and we plan to do so in the future okay okay thank you Samantha. yeah so yinjie you can talk a bit about there okay uh, i will share some uh, recent uh, observation uh, recently uh, the deep learning framework uh, become more and more high level the PyTorch and the uh, uh, TensorFlow layer, uh, for example, the domain specific, specific library like MM detection for CB and uh, Hugging Face for NLP. Uh, the high level uh, framework also will meet the type errors. Uh, I think they should treat this, this problem in more early stage in design uh, stage because we, we also observe the hawk if else uh, assert uh, to prevent the type errors. Uh, so uh, this uh, is uh, can solve, solve the problem in current stage, but it's difficult for users to extend the framework. Uh, so we think that uh, although the framework become more and more high level, this uh, this error must to meet in the early stage because the third stage become more and more huge. You tune the hyperparameter. So okay, okay, good insight. Okay, thank you. So Harrison, you can uh, talk a bit. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think one of the big challenges with uh, fuzzing in general is that there are a lot of cool tools that people are building, but they're hard to actually apply to real software. Like a lot of these tools work well in an academic setting, but then you try to apply them to like real code and it's just difficult. So uh, that was sort of one of the things we were trying to focus on with, with our work is really just to make it accessible and easy to easy for developers to actually learn and start using. And I hope that uh, 
more, more future work in fuzzing uh, goes along this route and actually tries to make it easy to use. Okay, okay, thank you, Harrison. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, uh, the time is uh, nearly uh, reached the, the end of time. So, yeah, so let's thank all the four speakers for the wonderful talk. And uh, I think uh, we also have a very good question. For